Hi, everybody. My name's Dan DiDio. I'm publisher of DC Comics. I want to thank you all for coming here today. Um, this is a lot of fun. I, you know what? It's not just fun because we got a chance to see the, uh, the DC uh, Universe be coming up there. Anybody sign up for that yet? Anybody see the service? It's kind of fun. If you missed their panel earlier, they gave away, uh, they gave away uh, subscriptions to everybody. So you guys got a chance to do that? Let us know and let's get out there and tell people how much we love it. But more importantly, let's get into what we're going to talk about today. Um, this is a fun panel for me. Um, I don't get a chance to do this this often, especially with the group of people that I have. Um, but this is the DC All-Stars panel, but it's not really a DC All-Stars panel, it's comic book All-Stars. People who really make a difference in the industry, people that you like to follow, and more importantly, these are the people that inspire other people to want to become artists and writers and just be involved in comics themselves. And, you know, I've been a fan almost my, I feel like my whole life, like you guys. I used to be in that audience all the time cheering and wanting to meet everybody. And there's that experience that comes with meeting your idols, the people you love to work with, and really getting a chance to learn what it takes to be in the comics industry, and more importantly, um, how you can make it in there yourselves. And their stories I found that inspired me, and I'm hoping they get a chance to inspire you too. And I want to bring out some people with me today that I think you'll have some fun with. So, in no particular order, because I completely forgot who's in the back room, and I'm going to forget one of them, I'm sure. Um, I'd like to introduce, uh, well, I know him as Mark Simpson, the artist behind uh, the Magic the Gathering cards. You might know him as Jock, the artist behind uh, the Batman, Black Mirror, and also the Batman Who Laughs, Mr. Jock. Is it Miss? Is it a Mr. Jock? All right, next up, next up. Hey. Next up. He made his bones and he got everybody excited writing fan fiction for Valiant Comics. He, he did not. <laughs> he, he did novels that sold in the tens. The, just the tens, right? But then all of a sudden, he got onto a character called Batman, and we know him as Mr. Tom King. <laughs> Next one up, he started working on Malibu Comics, Eternity Comics. Anybody remember Malibu Comics, Eternity? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> right? The X mutants all those new ideas that were out there. But now he did a, made a great career for himself working on Jonah Hex and also on Harley Quinn, Mr. Jimmy Pamiotti. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next one up. She started on Barbie. Most people want to start on Barbie, but she started on Barbie. But then seemed to graduate onto things like Before Watchmen, Silk Spectre, and then also Harley Quinn, Amanda Connor. <laughs> Next one up. He toiled in us obscurity for 20 years, working for some minor company, doing minor work. <laughs> I didn't mention anybody by name yet. <laughs> and yet, all of a sudden, he found his way over here, found the shining beacon. He got popular because he was on Superman, but got really popular and, and likable working on Young Justice, Mr. Brian Bendis. <laughs> Okay, next one up is an artist who decided to break in, not in baseball, but drawing baseball players with the Toronto Blue Jays comic book. How many people's got Toronto Blue Jays comics? How many people are Canadian? Okay, we got more, you could have the Toronto Blue Jays. But he decided to make a difference, and we need another chair. I counted my chairs. What? I've got two more. Two more chairs. <laughs> One more chair. We got it. He started on Blue Jays. Then he decided to work on superheroes called Punk Rock Jesus. But now he's doing Batman White Knight, Mr. Sean Murphy. <laughs> and we need actually one more chair, guys, if that's possible. If not, he'll keep stand next to me because he paces as much. Ah, here we go. I got him. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. 
He's the one who needed no chair but gets one now. <laughs> he first introduced the 27 panel page in comics, didn't catch on, but seemed to make a name for himself on things like Batman and metal and anything with one word, but he's got two names, Mr. Scott Snyder! <laughs> Okay, as you can see, we brought together a great group of guys and lady to talk about what it's like to be in the comics business. Um, this is important to, for me because I'm always interested in what's the secret sauces to make comics, and more importantly, what it is and what, how you challenge yourselves and where you draw your inspirations from. So, Jock, I want to start with you first, okay? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, how long have you been in the business? Uh, I started in the year 2000. 2000. And, if, and we, we, we joked around about the gathering cards, but really, what did you start really working on in the beginning? Um, so, yeah, I did do Magic of the Gathering cards for a little while, and Battletech cards, and role-playing game work, and my first comics work was for 2000 AD in the year 2000. Um, and uh, then, thank you. Any 2000 AD fans? <laughs> there, yes, thank you. One of the greatest comics in the world, apart from DC ones, obviously. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and, and came over to DC 03, I think, with, with uh, The Losers. The Losers, and uh, Losers was well known because your writing partner's name was Andy Diggle, and they were known as the team of Diggle and Jock, which... Uh, which is kind of... Uh, <laughs> which, which could have ended your career right there, and yet you found a way to flourish and move on past that. You're welcome. <laughs> in, in working on it, who were your inspirations for getting into the comics business? How did you first break in? And more importantly, um, what are you looking at? You, have you looked at your career and said to myself, you know, did I ever expect to be at this place? Oh, uh, 100%. Um, I was very lucky. My generation growing up in the UK, 2000 AD was a phenomenally uh, influential comic. It gave us Alan Moore, Brian Bolland, Mark Miller, Dave Gibbons. Uh, you know, I mean, it's insane the amount of people, the of British guys that started on 2000 AD. And I picked that up when I was about age 14, I think. I, I wasn't too young, but I was. As soon as I picked 2080 up, I knew I wanted to draw comics. Like, that was it. That, that, that's what I wanted to do. Um, but it's always a bit of a pipe dream. You know, you, you sort of feel like, um, or you hope that you can do it. Um, I kind of felt in my gut that I could do it, but you still don't know. You might, you know, you might be naive. Um, so to answer your question, do you think that I would be sat here right now? It's like, no way. You know, I, I, was, I was, you hope, but um, yeah, I, I feel incredibly lucky to have done the, the, the work that I've done, you know. In comics and also in films and stuff, it's uh, it's been. I feel very lucky. Yeah. Is it? You know what? And I, I don't go in any particular order. I like to jump around. So I'm going to go all the way into Scott for a second. Scott, when your first work was over at DC, what did you? What was the first projects you did over there? The first thing I did at DC was American Vampire. And I, yeah, thank you. We're actually we're bringing it back uh, in a year. I'm really excited. Um, but yeah, I, it, I sent it in and it was all I ever wanted to do and actually it got rejected the first time around and I remember just being so crushed and we were broke and we had a mortgage and all that stuff and it was Mark Doyle who was like, we don't usually look at pitches again, but if you, if you put more heart into it and stop making it such an elevator pitch and just say what it's really about, uh, give it one more try and I did and they took it and I'm forever grateful. Wait, wait, wait. You had a co-writer. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did, right. Stephen King was also on the book. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, wait, wait. Who? They rejected no, Stephen no, King? They're like, no, no, no we don't. <laughs> no, actually, the, the, the funniest thing was Stephen King, um, I sold the book without him. Right. And then what happened was they bought the book, and then they were like, do you know anybody that might want to do a blurb or promote it? And I was like, oh, from the book world, I know Stephen King. And they, you know, I remember calling them and being like, oh, he, I, call, I called him and he said he might be willing to um, do a blur, but when I was talking to him, he said he might want to do an issue. And I left, like, the message on Friday after the offices were closed, and it was, like, Monday, 8 a.m., everybody in the office called and were like, did you just say Stephen King would write an issue of American Vampire? You don't need to write an issue of American Vampire. Then. Like, that's not Stephen King, right? And so I was, A, I was bummed because if he had been on it when I sold it, I would have made some money. <laughs> like, I, you know... But no, he, uh, I was very, very grateful, and he was amazing. But he wasn't, uh, when we first sold it, it was just me. So I was very grateful to Mark and everybody at DC for taking a chance on me. And Jock was actually, I'm going to tell you this, like, 
uh, my first superhero work was uh, Black Mirror, you know, which we did for uh, Detective Comics. And, and, uh, and when I got on Detective Comics, it was another artist, and the, I, I had loved Jock's work, and I, and I knew he'd be right for the thing, uh, for the story. And I went to San Diego on my own dime just to meet him, I, to be like, and I called him, and we didn't know each other, and I was like, I have this story, you don't know me, I'm starting the series American Vampire, but, and he was so great, he was like, let's go meet at a bar out in the gas lamp and whatever. And we met, and I was pitching him this story, and I was drinking with him, and I just remember being like, if I don't keep up with him, he's gonna think I'm a total pussy and not wanna do this story, and it's <laughs> Batman. And I'm a much smaller man than him. And I remember Mike Martz, the editor, was like, if you can get him to say yes, then you can work with him, but otherwise, you, you know, whatever. And he never thought that I'd convince him. And I remember just being like, and then James Jr., blah, 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 and then, you know, this and that. And at the end, he was like, I have a good feeling about this, let's do it. And I was so upset, I was so excited. I mean, I went back and I went and I wrote Mike Martz an email, and I, I literally was, I still remember this. I was like, guess what, Mike? Jock is in and in and in and in and I fell asleep. I totally passed out with my hand on the keyboard and I woke up. It was like a thousand ends. A thousand ends. And I was like, I'm a professional writer. Whatever, I'll erase that. And so that, that was my glorious start at DC. <laughs> and thank you. Oh my God. Amanda, I'm coming to you. Yes. Okay. Cubert School, correct? Cubert School, and and actually, you said the um, you you said something before that wasn't quite accurate. I did not start on Barbie. Uh oh. I started my first story ever was Yellow Jacket. Yellow Jacket. Yellow Jacket story. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, yeah. I've never heard of the character. Have yeah, no idea no, what you're no. discussing. Who? who <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that? What, what that's that Barbie. Jacket, I get uh, Yellow Jacket, not so much. <laughs> yeah. But it was your Cubert School and all that, and also you were a retailer. Right? I was. I was in retail. I used to have a comic book store in North New Jersey, which is actually still there. Funny books. <laughs> now, now, I have to ask the question. You're running a comic book store. You're part of that. What did you always want to be in the industry? Is this something you aspire to do? And, and how, much, how much of that do you, did you want to draw and be part oh, of? Oh, I, I wanted to. Um, well, I mean... Originally, I wanted to be a lion tamer. That was my my <laughs> <laughs> my my six-year-old, you know, dream career was a lion tamer. Obviously, and then it was astronaut and action movie star and race car driver. But through all that, I could always draw. So you know, my mother's like, she's going to be the next Georgia O'Keeffe, and I'm like, I want to do comics. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I always wanted to do comics, and I grew up on Mad Magazine, and I grew up on Wonder Woman. So, uh, so yeah, I went into comics. That's it. And when did you feel that you were a comic professional then? When did you first feel like you, like really this was your career? Oh, um, I, when, would, when did I first really feel like a comic? Probably, I don't know, not until a few years later. It didn't sink in. I, I would say when I, probably when I did, probably when I did Birds of Prey and, and, uh, and Terry Moore wanted to work with me. I was like, oh, I've made the big time. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And, yeah. and I got to go to Jimmy right next to you on that. This whole lemon tamer thing, does that ever work its way around the house? It hurts. It really hurts. <laughs> <laughs> She's good with a whip, I, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you worked in advertising. Yeah, I was, I was, well, I went to high school of art and design here in New York for comics. And, um, and at the time, that was the late 70s, and, and the comic artists I met were all poor. So I was like, I need to go into something else. So I went into advertising, and while I was in advertising, towards maybe right before I was around 30, I started taking on inking work, and I said, maybe, maybe I could give this comics thing another shot. And I started, uh, I had a buddy of mine I went to high school with, Mark Texera, who's a pretty famous artist, and um, he uh, needed background help. So I, was, so I would go up to the Marvel offices, like after work, after my regular job, and help him ink uh, Punisher and Ghost Rider, like every night. Yeah. And eventually I started showing my own work around, and that's how I got into comics. I bugged the editors enough until I started getting steady work. And again, that was all through Ikki, and then you made the shift over to writing. And how much was, how was that change for you? How was that? The, the change, well, it was... Because I've had wonderful editors, um, the change was pretty easy because they, I, you know, I was offered work that nobody, they thought, you know, somebody either didn't get their book in or it was going to be canceled in five issues. You understand that yeah. one, Dan? I know that and, one. And, and um, so I was there and ready to go and, and, and learn while I was working. And, and uh, I got to do, you know, Deadpool 
at Marvel, and then Dan and I worked together on Superboy uh, <laughs> after that. And um, it, it took a little while because, um, again, when you do one job long enough, they know me as Anchor, uh, they, they, that you want to do something else, you have to kind of like retrain the editors to say, look, I can also do this, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but, it's, but it's been great. I mean, the editors, are the, they're the ones that had faith in me, so they made it happen. And uh, I have to do the last piece of the puzzle, too. It's also you have a good sense before. When you started up Marvel Knights, you helped create that. I mean, yeah. that's, that was something from the ground up as well that, that really wasn't part of the inking or the writing, but really more of the business side. Yeah. The, the, you know, Marvel Knights was, it was just, Joe and I were, Joe Casado and I were putting out our own comics. We were self-publishing. And Marvel was in a spot where they just would try anything, obviously, because they called us. And, um, <laughs> and we put together, you know, we, we just, the whole secret to Marvel Knights is like, was let's get the right team on the right character. That's all we did. And then, and then you know, babysat them. Um, but we got very lucky, and, and I think uh, with the help of Kevin Smith, because we were, we were helping Kevin on some of his smaller films, um, we kind of guess, yeah, he's pretty good, right? That guy, we're like, we're like Kevin. Um, so with the help of that, I mean, Marvel Knights, it just, you know, is the right place and the right time. So it, it's a career of hard work and being in the right place at the right time. Excellent, thank you. And you know, it's funny, we're talking Marvel Knights. You know, it's, we think about this, and we, we use this expression in DC now, pop-up imprints, and we've been discussing that a lot. Uh, we did this with the Young Animal, but really Marvel Knights might have been the, the first and the foremost of that. That's why I'm always interested in that story, because it really is a template for what we're doing. And Brian, you're about to take on something like this right now with the, with the Wonder Comics, but more importantly, you've had a really full career also. I mean, I have to, you have to ask, and these guys want to know, what it's been like to make the switch after 20 years with Marvel moving over to DC? It, it, truly fascinating. I, and, and so many people ask me, like, like this whole weekend has been people, what's it like? Like, 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 like I'm being held hostage or there's some danger involved. Or, <laughs> like, like, so, and, and I, I was really excited to get up here and tell everyone, like, what an amazing journey it's been. It, uh, of course, there were some ups and downs with my health that, were, that, that made it seem more dramatic than it might have been normally. Mm -hmm. But um, what's fascinating is Marvel and DC actually do things very differently. They actually like, make the sausage differently. Yeah. And that, uh, for a craft junkie like myself, is just fascinating to go getting, having been used to one way for so long. And they're both great ways. There's, they're, they're both equally good, but they're just different. And then there's processing to the, the different language and the different co communication and, and, and just the energy of everything. I, but it's leaving one group of very talented, passionate, loving people and meeting another group of very passionate, talented, loving people. Right. So, no, it really is. And I, I can't even joke about it because it's so sweet how, how much everyone cares about each other and loves each other. And to get to peak a Lily feels like now I'm behind the curtain, but even to peek behind the curtain that I wasn't even allowed to see behind for 20 years is, and then, you know, everyone wants to th thinks there's like some giant secret, but you know, it's just awesome people making awesome comics. That's so. Great. Thank you. Sure. I'm gonna go over to Sean for a second. Sean, one of the things I found most interesting that you did when we first met, yep. several times, first time. <laughs> is, you know, you came in and you, you went with something very, in some ways, very aggressive with a Punk Rock Jesus series, yeah. which is a really interesting way to make a mark for yourself. How is it, and, you know, it's seriously, and it's a, it's a book that you wouldn't think it approved, and yet it did, and you wind up working on it. How was that as your approach to something like that versus Batman? How do you see when you're creating material anything different from each other, or do you approach it all the same way? Yeah, um... Yeah, punk rock Jesus is not the business move. It's <laughs> like, I can imagine DC getting that and be like, what are we publishing? Like, who approved this? I think it was Karen. Can we change the title? <laughs> yeah, they wanted to change the title. And then someone at marketing was like, wait, you have a book called Punk Rock Jesus and you want to change the title? <laughs> so DC went with it, to your, to your credit. <laughs> and um, with White Knight, I knew I was tackling politics. Um, and I knew that I, I like to write about difficult subjects that seem boring. I know politics is, we're all tired of it at this point, but I wanted to do it in a fun way that sort of spoke to, to both sides and um, show Gotham that was a real city, not uh, necessarily just a comic book city. And I think the trick was to uh, make the 
points that I wanted to make without it becoming boring. And if that is not enough for you, I threw in a shitload of Batmobiles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, and another thing I, I found interesting when we were first when we were first meeting there is you're really you have, were very passionate about working with other talent, and you had the Big Brother idea with working all the talent and all that. What was the what was the genesis of a lot of the, what you were trying to do there? Uh, you know, I got a <laughs> I, I bought a house I couldn't afford, and uh, <laughs> my I had a bunch of. <laughs> students writing me saying, do you need an assistant? Can I erase your pages for you? And I was like, no, I do it all by myself. No, <laughs> go, you know, I don't need you to bother me. And I thought, well, what if I charge these people to live with me and then they can pay my mortgage and we'll put out a book and I'll like do it and make myself look really congenial by like helping their careers or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally scammed them. The, the funny is I, I actually guest taught like one of your things where I called in and there was no heat in the house, you remember? And it was, it was winter in Maine and all these kids were like, they were drawing with mittens and stuff like yeah. that and I felt so bad. Yeah. Do they get heat after they finish the pages? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and water and a hot shower if they were good yeah I bought a house that was not insulated so here we are up in the attic with like two space heaters uh, my dog kept farting the whole time so that was fun and uh, these poor kids but uh, we're all still friends to this day and they managed to have careers uh, I think Dan hired a couple of them for a few projects so it worked out, but I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna do that again. <laughs> Quite the inspiration. How much did story. you pay? How much did you charge them to work for you? I, I think we wind up paying them. Oh, I don't. No. I always feel like I'm doing this backwards. I always feel like I'm doing this backwards. And speaking of doing backwards, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's up? I didn't do it. No. <laughs> That guy. I don't know how many people are aware of not just your writing ability, but also your interning ability. I've interned like a madman. And the, the fact of the matter is. You interned both at Marvel and DC, correct? Or Vertigo? I did. I, I, I photocopied uh, uh, Marvel Knights pages. It was really depressing because I was, I was in charge of every script that came in and I would read all of them so, I could, so Chris Claremont could complain about them to me. And uh, not that he's ever complained before, it was the first time. And so, um, <laughs> and, but we would read the Marvel Knights scripts and they were so much better than the other scripts. <laughs> And like the whole company knew, they were like, uh-oh, there's trouble coming, and it's, it's Jimmy Pomiati. I mean, it was like a truck headed towards the company. It was our job to be yeah. lifted up a little bit. Yeah, well, yeah anyways, yeah, I've interned for both, yes. And, it, and realistically, that shows me that this is something you've always wanted to do. Yes. And, and how long a road was that for you to get to ultimately where you feel this became a career? Uh, I don't know, it was like last week or something? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't think I'm there yet. I'm still waiting yeah, to have that feeling of being a professional. <laughs> Do you have some vouchers for me to sign? Do I need oh, no. <laughs> no, we're good. Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, well, it's weird because my, my career started in this room. Like, we're physically in the room my career started. It was right back there by that door, right? Um, I came here in uh, NYCC 2013. And, uh, yeah, right, 2013, that was a fucking rockin' year. Uh, <laughs> unless you were born in that year, in which case, fuck you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> seriously. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, Karen Berger, uh, I, I emailed all the DC editors, and they're all like, no. Uh, but Karen Berger, uh, who discovered all those 2000 AD people we were talking earlier, uh, pulled me off the slush pile and said, meet me at NYCC. And uh, and we we and we it was a panel. Scott was on the panel. It was a Vertigo panel, and uh, and I met her back there, and that's how my career started. And that right there. You know what? I'm going to go to the, the four guys that started with Vertigo because we mentioned four people here with Vertigo. When you started with, with Vertigo, was your aspiration to create your own ideas? You know, to do create your own material, or was it something that you really wanted to get pulled into the DC universe? Scott, want to go first? Well, I mean, I wanted to do both, but I mean, I was just so excited to finally have my foot in comics in the first place. My whole goal was to just not totally screw it up, and that was it. And especially when you're working with Karen, I mean, and you go to that office, I still remember that office in New York, and it had like the Swamp Thing uh, figurines and just all the books that she had worked on. You walk in, and there's just such history to it that really I was just terrified and you, you spend the first, I think, year at least in just abject terror of just messing it up. So for me it was really wanting to create something special and knowing, I, if there are any aspiring writers out there, I'd say, you know, the same thing with the American Vampire pitch 
the, the thing that she had said and Doyle had said to me um, rings so true that the elevator pitch kind of stuff is important, but it really is writing something that is true to you and the things that you worry about and that you care about. That's how you get something original. And she was so encouraging about that stuff that my goal was to just try and keep that compass, whether I did superhero stuff or my stuff creatively at that moment. It was such an incredibly transformative and uh, educational moment in my life, like that year, those two years. I was just very, very grateful to her and to everybody there. That's great. Hey, Sean, do you feel like you compromised yourself by doing Batman? <laughs> no, and I mean this in a nice way. It's, you have a lot of passion in for what type of stories you want to tell. You have a real point of view of things you're hungry for. Do you feel that by doing work for higher books or something like that affects your voice? No, no, I, I think there's a way. So you have art, you have commerce. And I know I started off doing punk rock Jesus and whatever, but I truly believe there's a way to do both. You can say what you want to say, have artistic integrity, and make, you know, sell some books at the same time. Like, I think there's a way to do all of it. And I think this is something Scott and I talk about a lot. Like, people think that it's one or the other. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to hold out for uh, the day where I could do my own Batman book. And if I had known when I was a kid watching the animated series that I would one day take these episodes and somehow filter them into my own universe, it'd be some kind of a new voice. Like... I'm blown away. I don't even know. So thank you all, by the way. Um, yeah. And, and Jack, you have such a unique style. Did you feel that it can translate to any character, or does it you just gravitate to Batman itself? Uh, I'm still surprised anyone lets me do any comics, to be honest. <laughs> I, no, I, feel very, I feel really, really lucky. that People talk about style and stuff, but it's, it's not something that... I, 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 I don't know how other guys are, but I don't draw the way I draw because uh, cause, um, cause it's like a like a considered thing it's just, it's just how i've naturally evolved over the years and and i try and just do what i'm into what i think looks cool and if someone else thinks it looks cool too then that's like a, 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 a huge bonus but like i remember talking about vertigo um I remember with the losers because it was like an action book and that was not traditional vertigo fare at all um, so I thought okay and, and I, I didn't expect to be doing an action book at, at vertigo either and i thought okay well if i'm going to do this a, I've got to try and make it the best action comic anyone's ever read. I mean, that, that, that's like that's, that's 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 your kind of you know that's what you shoot like aim high, miss high kind of thing. Um, and B, I've just got to do it my own way. And and, and and luckily, the losers was was received you know fairly well, and they, there's even a movie made of, of it and everything. So how did it feel to see something a movie made of? Oh, I, oh, oh, here we go. So <laughs> Sin City had just come out, and and and, and I think that gave Hollywood like. Um, an appreciation of, of the source material. So when we visited the Losers set, like I, I didn't even know if, um, you know, I knew the big characters, Jensen and Cougar and Clay, but I didn't know whether, like I thought Chris Evans that plays Jensen, for example, I thought he'd probably wear the little John Lennon glasses that, 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 I, that I gave, gave him. But he, um, we went to the Losers set, visited the uh, Losers set in, in Puerto Rico. And um, me and Andy Diggle were there, and we're, t I think, talking to Zoe Saldana, who played Aisha, and, um, and she, she turns to our left, and she just goes, hey, Jensen. And I turn around, and Chris Evans walks, walks towards me, and he, I mean, it was like the, the, the character that only existed in my mind and on a page literally walked towards me and shook my hand, and he had the same facial hair and the long, weird sideburns I gave him, which Chris Evans had to have for three months. I'm sorry, Chris. They were awful. <laughs> Um, it's just a very surreal, like you say about, did you ever expect to be in those kind of positions? Like, no, I did not. And that was the most surreal moment. And they were all fantastic. Stayed up drinking with Chris all night in, in his apartment where he had one of my drawings on the wall of, like, Jensen. I mean, it's just, like, who, who, like, how, how does that happen? You know, so I feel very lucky. Excellent. Thank nice. you. Thank you. Jim, you're gonna, forgive me, Jimmy, I'm going to go to you for something that is a little different. As a, as a veteran in the industry, <laughs> you've been in for quite a while. And realistically, how is it for you to feel like you're constantly needing to reinvent yourself and pitch yourself? And how does it feel to be just in this business where you're constantly seeing so much change and where you're feeling part of it all? Well, I, I like, first of all, I like change. Yeah. So I don't fear change. I, I kind of like the idea that things are changing. It, keeps me interested because if everything stayed the same it'd be boring we'd all be bored and I always say a career is like a roller coaster there's the highs and the lows and the lows are just in, as important as the highs you learn from the lows you apply it to get to the highs again so 
uh, for me, it's just the, the the part of the career being around so long. It's 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 for me, it's a giant learning curve as well because I feel like I'm still learning how to write, learning how to draw, learning how to do what I'm doing, and it doesn't stop. And I think, you know, maybe on your deathbed, the last second you go, I got it, and then you die, <laughs> you know? But I don't think it's anything that you um, ever feel like, I think if you have that feeling like I nailed it and now everything's perfect, I don't think anybody's ever had that feeling up here. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's also part of the drive that keeps us trying to top ourselves. So, uh, you know, that's always been my thing, yep. you know? And I'm gonna go to Amanda now. I mean, there's so much positive momentum right now with women in comics yeah. being pushed forward, yeah. something, and which is really exciting to see. And everybody here is excited by what's coming on and how the industry is growing over and over again. But you're fighting tooth and nail early and on. How was it to be a woman in comics when you were first breaking in? Well, it, it's funny because I, I didn't, um, I didn't really just, I just, here's what Joe Kubert was telling us when we were the Kubert School. He's like, Comics is the hardest thing to get into. You're gonna have the worst time getting work. You're gonna have to work your butt off and it, you're just gonna have to go back there like 15 times before they give you a smidgen of work. So I just assumed that it was hard for everybody and I expected it to be hard. So I didn't really see it as, I'm not getting work. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't worry that it was because I was female. I just thought, oh, it's just tough. You know, so when I finally got my first job, I was like, yes, and I just saw myself more as a comic artist instead of a female comic artist. Great. So. Excellent. Thank you. And now I'm going to go to you, Brian, and we're going to get back into the, the topic of All-Star. And, you know, a lot of people think you're at the top of your game working at Marvel. And the, the, the level of work, the, the, just the, the amount of material created and the success you have with it is amazing. And now you come over to DC, how much pressure do you put on yourself to try to maintain a certain level, or how do you approach making that switch? Um, well, first of all, I want to say, you know, I don't think you and Jill Thompson and then Colleen Doran get enough credit for the paving of the way you have done for the women that are working. Thank you so now. much. Thank you. You took a lot, you took, I, I was there for some, and there was a lot of struggle, so thank you. And Jill and Dor Doreen started even before I did, and my role model was Wendy Peeney. That's right. And I love Wendy Peeney. That's right. No, there's, uh, we, we can list a lot of women. Oh, it's yeah, just, yeah. It's just, I was, I, I watched a little of this, so I Thank I, you I so much. It. So anyway. Thank you. Um, listen, you know, it, it's never about, like, for me, you, you figure out there's cr creative success and there's commercial success, but the real success is creative success. Mm -hmm. Like that, like the, the, the goal for truth the, on the page is, is the goal. So every day it's about sitting down and going, how, how, how can I get to truth? Can I, can I through whatever I'm dealing with right now, can I, can I get on the page some truth that someone else will relate to, right? Can I, can I communicate today through these pages. So every day you sit down and do that, and that's the goal. You, you don't worry about everything else. You, don't, like, you just keep the, the goal pure. The goal is tell us some truth, write a story, share yourself so people can get some sort of entertainment and or healing, or like something from it that they can relate to. And then that's all I do. I just, I focus on that. All the other stuff is amazing, unbelievable, but I can't control it. I don't understand some of it, so I just focus on what I wanted to do, which was make comics and make as good a comic and as honest a comic as I'm, I'm capable of at the moment. So. Thanks. Very nice. Thanks. Okay, now the t uh, time to ratchet up the questions a little bit, get a little bit tougher. Okay? I'm going to start with Tom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fifteen. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know square roots. <laughs> Big question is, yes. as, as creators, this constant pressure of your time to maintain a level of success. And now through online and everything that goes on around you, you get a lot of people putting questions to you and challenging you and, and challenging your ability and everything like that. How do you navigate the, the noise of the world around you to stay true to the art or trace true to the, what you want to tell in your story? Or does it change with you? Can I call you out? I'm gonna call you out. Can I call you out? <laughs> My wife and I called Jimmy the voice of God behind his back <laughs> because he give. He, I was at I was at Comic Con this year and I, I did okay and, uh, and 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 Jimmy comes up to me and I'm really nervous because 
you, you, you're doing well, you're, you're winning awards, your, your comics are selling, all that stuff. And you're just, but you're, you, you get, it, it makes you more nervous, because you're like, now I'm going to fuck it up. Sorry, now I'm going to fuck it up. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, you're, so, so, and, uh, and, I, and, and Jimmy, who sees through the industry, just saw this in me, I think, and, and, was, and was like, Tom, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, yeah. And he took me aside, and he, and he, go, he goes, Tom, you, you, you got to remember why you got in. You got in because you love writing comics. And as long as you still love writing the comics, then you win. Like, that's it. And if, you, and if you let all that other stuff you're worried about destroy you, then you're just destroyed. So would you rather win or be destroyed? I mean, he said it much better than that. Much, you know, like, good, it was oh, the no, Marvel Knights good. version. That was like my, that was the Marvel version. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and it was, it, man, I'm telling you, it was like, it, it was, I was sitting there, they were like Will Eisner's words ascending on me, and, I, and, uh, and uh, I was in shock for the rest of the day, and, uh, and I've, I, ever since then, I just hear, I hear stupid, he's like, Jimmy Cricket, he's Jimmy Cricket, right? He's yeah. like, in my head, you know, every time I start freaking out, I hear his voice, I was like, you got into this because you love doing it, just, so just love doing it, and you'll get through the next day, and I, I do, I focus on that, and voice of God, right there. <laughs> well, thank you, buddy. <laughs> Here's, Scott, here's back how to you. I do it. What? S a slight variation of the same question. Yeah. Have you ever gotten so much pressure from a story you're telling and what you're doing with Batman that you've ever changed what you wanted to do? Or did you ever just push it all the way through to make sure you stay true to your own sense? Yeah, no, I've never changed anything. That I, I always felt that would be the worst. Do you know what I mean? Like that it would, on some level, I wouldn't be able to live with myself with that. Um, I've definitely had tremendous bouts of you know, anxiety and, and, you know, am I any good at this? And all of those kinds of terrible fears. And I think one of the things that's funny, like Tom just brought up Jimmy, Jimmy was, you've been really kind to me too. Uh, the first year on Batman for me was really hard. I didn't expect it to be a number one. I still remember when Dan told me that. At first I didn't even think I was gonna be writing Batman, but I got moved over and then it was a number one. I was just terrified out of my head. Um, and the whole year was just so, terrifying and the only thing I could do was go to my friends Greg Capullo was amazing you were you know you were great too um, Jimmy he was great he, he actually by the way can I say one thing he was really funny like he yeah yeah he called me I'll tell about whatever I won't I won't call you out but the uh, oh please do please do all right all right why okay yeah, why stop well he, he, we're, here, like, we're here in a, this intimate setting with some of our closest friends I think we could share stories <laughs> well I got I got through that year but uh, again with the help of like Jimmy and Greg and a lot of people that you know, help me out. And Dan, you were great too. I was not easy to work with. I was just trying to self-destruct almost, where I was, you know, out of control a lot of the time, I feel like, my temper, everything. Cause I just didn't know how to deal with the pressure of all of it. But the only thing I knew was I loved the story I was telling and that was it. And then I got through and we did the, he had been a good friend and we got through and we did the wake. And we were working on the wake and we were at a con in Boston around this time. And I was like, oh man, I'm so glad we have become such good friends. And he was like, what do you mean? We're not really, uh, we're not really good friends. <laughs> I was like, and I was like, so, and he goes, well, when are we ever, you know, I want to, but when are we gonna become real friends? And I was like, so offended by this. <laughs> so I was like, what are you even talking about? And he was like, no, no, you know, you've been so wrapped up in your stuff and you call about work stuff, but we don't actually like hang out and that and everything. And I was so mad, I was like, I'm gonna become this guy's goddamn best friend now. I'm gonna call him all the time. I'm not, I was like, always gonna be in his face. And the greatest thing about it was he was totally right. And we wound up becoming, we came out to Maine and everything. And if I had known that those words were gonna be too, like written in your tombstone, <laughs> I would have chosen them more carefully. <laughs> no, well, I think the, the bigger point and the thing I was thinking about when you were talking, Tom, too, is that it really is the friendships and that stuff too that get you through that pressure. It's having people that are your creative partners. I call Tom, you know, I call Jock. Jock has seen me at my worst. Like we, you know, I called Brian when I was upset about stuff. Not long. I mean, we all, we rely on each other to keep ourselves honest on the page and also to get us through tough times. And yeah. I really feel like we have a great family right now at DC in general and, you know, in comics all around, so. Yeah. For George, me, I wanted to say, Jimmy actually reached out to me as well. You're like, you're like the godfather of comics or something. Uh, I see you guys on a downward spiral all the time, and I'm like, no, 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 wait. It doesn't have to be that bad. So there, there I was doing cocaine. <laughs> Which he bought In for me. In walks Jimmy Pomelo. He's like, no, no, you don't want to do that. 
No, you, right, uh, I did Joe the Barbarian with Graham Morrison, and I, you fa we found each other at Baltimore, and uh, I didn't have a great show, but uh, meeting you was, was great, and you gave me some advice, and he's like, don't spend all your money on bullshit, you like, got a plan for the future kid, and you can do anything <laughs> you want, anything you want. And I go, well, I don't think DC's gonna let me do Batman anytime soon. He's like, no, no, you'll get it someday. Don't worry about that right now. And I don't know, I mean, you're, he's like a secret employee of yours. Like, he's on the payroll. He's gotta be. Because, like, he's touched all of our lives. He's like the red violin. <laughs> That's your new nickname. Red violin. That's it. I've known this guy 25 years. He hasn't said anything to me. Yeah, I, I, Brian. Word. Yeah, I know. Not one guy. I was you're like, doing well, just fine. You don't need my advice. Yeah, when, when's fine. my call coming, Jimmy? What, uh, we, what is this? We're gonna, we're gonna talk after this, buddy. <laughs> Amanda, has Jimmy given you any advice in your career? Oh, I, I always... I get it from her, by the way. She tells me, and then I tell these guys. That's how... And, and here's my advice, that, that previous question. My, here's how I do it. I forget to read my Twitter feed. I forget to look at my Instagram. I don't read the message boards. I always assume I'm going to fuck it up. <laughs> and then I just have fun and plow ahead. That's how I do it. That's it. <laughs> Pro probably the best advice for everybody. Okay. I want to go back to Sean for a second. This is an all-star panel. Do you can see hey, You know what, Dan? You and I aren't friends. You know that, right? <laughs> Let's start there. Trust me. In my Apparently, job, I have no it's friends. It's going to change your that. life. Trust me. <laughs> but I want to ask you a question. We're on an all-star panel. Do you consider yourself an all-star? Uh, I guess. I don't know. When do you guys, when do you realize you're... When, when do you realize you've made it? When can you admit it without ego? Like, I, I guess I've made it. When do you think you made it? Yeah. Um, probably with Batman White Knight. Okay. I mean, I, 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 came, to, I came to Dan uh, probably hungover or drunk or in between at a show. And I was like, Dan, like, make me your next Frank Miller. Like, I, I won't let you down. Like, I, can, I, I did Punk Rock Jesus. Like, you didn't want to do that book, but you did. And it sold. And that's good, right? So give me Batman. Like, I swear I won't let you down. I'm not a drunk. I'm not a hog. I don't, I'm not, you know, <laughs> blowing money on cocaine anymore, thanks to Jimmy. <laughs> like, like, I'm a, you need another Frank Miller. I'm young. I'm not going to stop working. I'm a good bet. And uh, I don't know if you remember that at all. I, have, but, I absolutely remember it. That's okay, why I went yeah. to you with the question. <laughs> So, anyway, and you said, you know, I think if there's um, a, a civil war, and you were joking, you said if there's a civil war between Marvel and DC, you're like the secret weapon. So, you know, hopefully that's what, what White Knight did, so. He told me I was the secret weapon. That's what he said, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, I pretty much said it to all you guys, just to get you moving. <laughs> Once again, I've never heard. <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> it's, it's the accent. You guys, you, you got to all figure it out yourself. And uh, that's a good question oh, for you, Jack. I mean, you had a lot of influence from the UK talent and in the, in the US market. Do you see differences in how, you, how is your work perceived in the UK versus how it's perceived in the US? Uh, again, I, I, was I, was, I was just very grateful that anyone liked, when I came over to, to, to DC and Vertigo, because of the book we were doing and the way that I was, I, I was doing it, I think, yeah, I think there is a, a difference, um, but I, I feel like it's kind of permeated all of comics now, I, I feel like maybe 20 years ago you would have got the marked difference of your Alan Moores and Grant Morrison's compared to some of the American writers, no offense. I mean, am I the only, I'm the only Brit up here. This okay. is why you don't Th this is where. I, yeah. This is where I completely ostracize myself <laughs> from all my friends. Um, We're gonna talk. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, there, there probably is a, a difference in sensibility, but I feel like in 2018, it's, we've all kind of merged together really now, you know, not just in comics, but in, in the world in general, you know, everything feels much closer, and I think um, those influences are kind of more, uh, not, not as not as obvious, perhaps these days, you know. But but I do feel very lucky coming from the 2008 thing, because honestly, that that 2008 that was like kind of lightning in a, in a bottle, you know, for the, uh, 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 that, at that time in the UK. So so yeah. Yeah, Tom, we're going to go back to you for a second. We're asking about the All Star, and I'm um, yeah. How how much uh, pressure do you put on yourself to maintain a certain level? of notoriety or success. We talk about... Notoriety. <laughs> no, no, but I mean... Put a lot of notoriety pressure yeah, on A little bit of little, little notoriety. But what I mean, am I doing sense. drunk tonight that I'll be in the paper? <laughs> <laughs> but, but all honesty, you, you, in your mind, you talk about wanting to do 100 issues of Batman. That's, that's a goal for yourself. 
How much pressure do you put on yourself to make sure that's the best it can be, the best work you can do? Uh, uh, too much is the right, yeah, too much pressure. I don't know. Uh, to, to me, like a comic page is a sacred space. And if you, every, every panel, uh, I mean, I, I grew up worshiping Alan Moore, and 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 when I read, sometimes I can read a three-page Alan Moore story, and I was like, that's better than seven trades I just read, and gives me more information, and I spent more time on it, and and it's because it because every panel is doing something, and every time I sit down, I was I was like, if I do this shitty, it it's a waste of these panels, it's a waste of the time, it's the waste. I'm not I'm not giving the medium the respect it deserves, and 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 so then I just get scared and 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 panic. So yeah, so so it's going it's going real well. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I'm going to go with you with the same question. Do you feel like with the body of work that you have, this, how much more do you have to prove? What else do you have to do? You know what? It's, I, you, do you think, like, you know when we first had that meeting, a little secret meeting, uh -huh. um, and you, you, you said to me um, uh, you, that one day you walked into Jim's office with the diamond catalog and said, Bendis is back on Daredevil again. Why won't he come here? Mm -hmm. Why is he, he's doing Daredevil for the third time, come here. And, and you told me that and, it, and I had never perceived it that way. I had never perceived that I was going back to Daredevil. I was looking at it like I'm 10 years a different person. I'm a different writer, I'm a different creator. I would like to apply that to this to see what it feels like. So I never felt like I was spinning a wheel or, or, or do, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, maybe I was, in a sense, abusing my place in, 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 in all of it, not knowing it, because no one was telling me to leave, no one was telling me to go anywhere, or, and I didn't feel any disconnect to the work, but at the same time, clearly I needed to move on to something else, and clearly I needed to have this mountain to climb that you put in front of me, yeah. and so that's, like I think, Whatever, whatever all-star means and whatever being like yeah. known in this business means uh, really it means this great opportunity to do more like oh oh then, then the people who came before me that had these opportunities right what did they do with them mm -hmm. well they kicked some butt so why don't yeah. you do that right I'm trying not to swear in front of the audience uh, but the, Tom but, does it for everybody don't worry I know but but I, I think of I think of creators who have the opportunity okay. that that you've given me and what they did with it and what and what over the course of time, people remember about them, right? When people think about Jack Kirby's time at DC, they, don't, they think about the fourth world. They think about, you know what, he dropped the biggest thing and, and, and left, right? They, he made the most of it. So that, that's, and, and every creator that I admire has done that. So that's what I think about, following in the footsteps of people who did good, true work, not thinking about All-Star. Does that make sense? Makes sense, perfectly. Scott, I'm gonna go to you for a second on conventions. We're here at a convention, and by the way, guys, you gotta understand for me, to play in front of a, a room this size with this many people, it's amazing, and they're here for you. And that's exciting. How has the convention experience changed for you over the years? When you first started out, you love your conventions, you love going out there, how much has that changed, and, and how has it changed you? Well, I, I still love it, I really do. I mean, and the people that I've been lucky enough to work with seem to really love it too. Greg has a blast, as you know. <laughs> at the con and all of that. I mean, but I remember my first conventions going to C2E2 was the first one I went to as a creator. And I remember going, we had one issue of American Vampire out. And I also remember because um, uh, Raphael, they sat us for some reason uh, at, uh, with Joe Kubert and uh, to sign. And we had like one issue, I know. <laughs> and uh, Raphael started crying. He was so moved by that. And I remember sitting with him at that moment. It was really uh, inspiring and we used to sit there and we'd, I'd, I'd give the comic book away, I'd be like, here, try this, and I'd watch people take it and walk to the trash and throw it out and then I would go get it out of the trash and bring it back and like wipe it off with my shirt <laughs> and then have it there again and the thing is like, you know, you now too, uh, now I'm like, damn all of you. <laughs> no, it's like, no, it's, it really is like we work all alone and you're, you're focused all day long. I think it's one of those careers that would drive a lot of people crazy because to make something good, you, or that you're proud of at least, you have to sit there with your own personal anxieties and, and hopes and just stare at them all day long on a screen and make something out of them. So you do that in a hole and to get to come to a con and meet the people that connect to that or read your stuff and say, I felt that way too or this moved me, or this helped me get through something, or this made me angry, all of it, 
is a tremendous privilege, you know? And I think all of us feel that, where we come here not just to hawk stuff or to, you know, to try and push stuff on you, but instead to say thank you because you guys give us the jobs that we always wanted to do since we were little and you respond to the things that matter to us. So it's a pleasure to get to come to cons, even when they're crazy and they're crowded and they're in the Javits and whatever. So we appreciate it. The Javits, is, I grew up here, the Javits is hard. <laughs> no, but we've, uh, we've all had our lives changed at conventions. Like, yeah. my, 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 like at a convention like this, Walt Simonson changed my life, right? Yeah. Like, like Joe Casada changed my life at a show like this. So I, I, I only think of how amazing they are. Like someone here in this room is gonna have their life changed. I know it, it's, about, it's, it's numbers, right? Yeah. It's amazing. Brian, I'm gonna ask you, how'd they change your life? What? How'd they change your life? Uh, when I was a little, when I was a youngin, when I was literally like 10 or 11 and I had uh, the beginnings of a portfolio, I uh, went to a, 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 you know, basement convention in Cleveland where I, I met John Toddlebin, mm -hmm. uh, the artist of Swamp Thing, at the height of Swamp Thing. Um, his art terrified me. I had never seen anything like it before. I was like touching it, it had texture to it. And um, my dad was, you know, talking about like the show and, and, and he goes, um, uh, my dad said, Dad, this is quite a, quite a quiet show. He goes, well, this isn't the actual show. The show's across the street where Walt Simonson is. And I went, Walt Simonson's across the street. Let's get the hell out of here. And I grabbed all my <laughs> stuff and I ran, knowing I just insulted John Toblebin. I didn't know it then, but now that I'm a professional, I know that was brutal. Like, I, I've, I've had that happen to me, so now I know what it feels like, right? So I, I went and I ran up to Walt Simonson and I dumped my portfolio. I literally pushed past his line like my thing was more important than everyone else's thing. And I got dump my portfolio in front of him and I said, please help me. And it was literally, like, I need anatomy, I need perspective, I need, like, I, like it was every, and he took me around the table and, and sat me down and put it all on the table and talked me through and let all the, and, and, and kind of taught me in front of everyone at his table and spent a good long time telling me what I need to do and sent me on my way. And by the end of that conversation, I was a comic book artist. Like there was nothing was going to stop me. Like there was whatever whatever hobby part of it was gone. Like I'm I'm now on a, on a path. And he then followed up with me a couple of times. I would send him stuff when it got better, and he would write back like snail mail letters, like actual yeah. like letters people would send. And yeah, and I think of him every single second I'm on the floor. Yep. Like 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 every single person deserves as much of that as they can get. So that, that's what I think. Yep, that's great. <laughs> and, for, and for you people who don't, who have never met Walt Simonson, truly one of the really nicest, most generous people in the industry, just an amazing thing. Um, Jimmy, I'm gonna go to you for a second. Conventions, New Yorker. He's a New Yorker of the crowd here, yeah. one of the New Yorkers of the crowd. Yeah. Have you seen the convention experience change? How was it for you as a fan? How is it now for you as a, a, as a professional? As a fan, most of the conventions were either, you guys will remember these, in the bottom, in the basement of a church <laughs> on 9th Avenue. Anybody remember those cons over there? Yeah. And there was even, when I was younger, Phil Sewling, and there was a lot of little shows in hotels. And um, my dad used to take me, and we used to buy comics, and he used to bargain, tell the guy, come on, he's a kid, give him a break, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so they used to be smaller, and, and I used to go with a little sketchbook, and I'd got George Perez sketch, and I would get a Dave Cockrum sketch, and I would just, I'd watch what kind of pens they had, so I could figure, that's the secret, that's how I'm gonna be able to make <laughs> comics, if I can get that pen. Yeah. Like the tool made a difference, yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, and, and then over the years, it just, as, you know, the career gets bigger, the cons started getting bigger. Um, but being a New Yorker, I see the same faces. A lot of you guys tell me, hey, man, I haven't seen you in 12 years. That kind of thing happens a lot here. Um, it's just gotten bigger. Um, but for me, it just means the audience is uh, more involved, and I like that. But um, it's still about the, uh, and, and everybody knows this with Amanda and I, it's still about you come up, we talk, we meet, we talk about the book, or we just say hi. It's about meeting the fans and the moments that is still the steady thing that the cons always have. With the interaction with you guys is why we're here. You know, we, if we need a pat in the back, we have Dan for that. That can call, <laughs> Dan call us up and go, yeah, you're great, you're great, get the book in, damn it. Um, <laughs> but, but being here for you guys and interacting, that's everything. So the cons have just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, 
but w what our goal at the cons are has stayed the same, is to connect with the fans. So uh, I, that's the thing, the only thing I've seen change really is the size and of the audience, pretty much. Tom, a question for you. Do you find, in your time with it, you see the lines getting longer, more people coming to see you, more people mobbing you? Um, do you find that intimidating or inspiring for when you, when you are coming in? Do you come out of here more invigorated or do you come out of here more exhausted from the conventions themselves? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know the answer, but you might as well go anyway. <laughs> I should say invigorating. That would be so fucking inspiring. Be like, yeah, but no, I'm so tired, guys. Oh, my God. <laughs> I've, I, I, I changed my signature so it's shorter because I, I, I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't afford this M. That's out. Uh, and my name is like three letters long. You know, I don't. Um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's But you have to be. The fan interaction is the most important thing you do at the con. I mean, because I remember, um, I remember going to a con and waiting in a long line to talk to a, a creator, and, and I won't say who his name, but it was Roy Thomas, and, uh, and he was like so shitty. I mean, but. But I love him. He's great work. But whatever. But uh, and and but uh, as soon as I had that sort of bad interaction, and he probably just had a bad day, and he was sick of someone saying, "Hey, I love the vision." He's like, "Yeah, fucking duh." Uh, but and so, but because of that one interaction, I was like, "I'm never reading Roy Thomas books again." Like, I don't like this guy. He's mean to me. Why? Why would he be mean to me? And so I do think of that. Like, this is. I mean, you you came here. You waited in a long line for just so we could have a. You don't. Who cares about a signed book? You care about those a five minute interaction. You can kind of talk to someone. Um, and have a human connection with the person who's making, who's in your life, who you like, you know, has a book in your coffee table. So, I mean, that's a super important moment. Um, it was for me. So, if, if people come to my table, I owe it to them uh, to, to not be Roy Thomas, is basically. <laughs> okay. Not that I'll ever tell you his name. All right, we have less than a minute left. I'm watching this clock tick down. So we have less than one minute left. I want to go to everybody. We're going to start with Scott. I want to know, who is your all-star? Who is the one who inspired you? Scott. Oh, uh, I mean, Frank. Frank Miller really was for me. Both, uh, I mean, meeting him, all of it. It was just the best. Sean. Uh, he took mine. So I'm going to go with a mix of uh, Scott Snyder. <laughs> no, uh, is was is that say, making amends for that whole other thing you said to him, or no? <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Frank, Alan Moore, Howard Chaikin, Walt Simonson, Art Adams. I can keep going. Absolutely. <laughs> Amanda. My mom, my dad, Frank Miller, and Chuck Jones. <laughs> <laughs> That's <Isn't> that obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy. My mom, my dad, e pretty much everybody I read. Too many names, and this one right here. Yeah, we knew that uh, answer. <laughs> Tom. Uh, Walt Simonson uh, and 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 uh, uh, Brian Michael Bendis. I would not be back in comics if his when he his comics brought my whole generation back in, and uh, it was and they were just go beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And Jock. Uh, really dull. Frank as well for me. Excellent. Okay, I think we're out of time. I want to thank our panelists. Thank, thank you. you all for joining us. Thank you for being on the DC's All Star Panel. Welcome. Hi, I'm Jackie Jennings with Sci-Fi Wire. If you can't get enough of New York Comic Con, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for news, interviews, cosplay, and so much more. What are you waiting for?